type for the dynamic complexity in the reverse learning system. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. And I would like to say before I begin that the results I will present you with today are based on work in progress from the past two and a half ish year. And, uh, and their point is to convince you about the importance of heteroclinic knots to, um, to the emergence of uh, complex phenomena in three dimensional flows. Let's see if it works. No, it doesn't. Um, I did not turn it off. I hope. This, uh, you just need to press with your okay. uh, sorry, uh, mouse. Okay, no problem. On the slides. No. Okay, great. No, it should work. It still does not. Mm -hmm. Okay, the laser works, but. Yeah, that's strange. Uh, never mind. I'll manage with it. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, no problem. So, uh, hmm? So, uh, before, yep. yeah. so before we uh, begin presenting the results, let's uh, do a brief recap of chaotic dynamics for flows. So let's assume we have a smooth vector field in R3, which generates a chaotic attractor like uh, the wrestler, sorry, like the wrestler attractor you see in this image. We would like to ask whether we can or cannot generalize its dynamical complexity. Now, this question is itself is a bit uh, too vague to be answered. So instead of uh, making this answer more precise, let's before uh, review another chaotic attractor, the uh, Lorentz butterfly attractor, and notice the differences between these two images. The uh, chaos in the Ressler attractor uh, is generated differently from the Lorentz one. That is, here we see that the trajectory of an initial, uh, of a generic initial condition on the attractor basically spirals around the origin and then injected back to the attractor. On the other hand, uh, the trajectory of some initial condition on the Lorentz attractor would uh, spin around the wings of the, butter, of the butterfly attractor. Uh, and in particular, it appears as if the chaotic dynamics generating this attractor are based on a tearing mechanism, as opposed to a folding mechanism we have here. Therefore, um, we would like to differentiate between the uh, two uh, complexities, which are essentially two different types of chaotic dynamics generated by these two attractors. And one way to do it is to characterize different, uh, um, different chaotic attractors by the different uh, knot types they generate. And uh, even though there are other uh, ways to do it, um, as far as uh, we're concerned in this talk, we'll uh, define dynamical complexity as the knot types generated by uh, the attractor, by the chaotic attractor, due to the simple reason that if we're given uh, two vector fields, then let's assume both of them generate chaotic attractors, then if they generate different knot types, uh, they cannot be orbitally equivalent on their respective uh, recurring set in the attractor. So one way uh, to study the dynamics of three-dimensional flows is to reduce them to the study of a discrete uh, time uh, two-dimensional dynamical system by the first return map. A first return map is uh, a local diffeomorphism wherever it is defined. Therefore, uh, before, uh, attempting to answer the question of dynamical complexity for flows, let's recall what the uh, theory of topological dynamics, uh, dynamics for, homo for uh, homomorphisms and diffeomorphisms has to say. And that is, as we've uh, heard yesterday and today, is the thurston nielsen classification. The thurston nielsen classification, uh, as was mentioned in the previous talk and yesterday, allows us to classify up to isotopy, the dynamics of a given homeomorphism on a compact surface, which uh, permutes uh, a finite set of uh, boundary punctures. And the particular case we're interested in is the pseudo of case. That is uh, when the isotopy class contains a chaotic map. 
The reason being that in that case, the dynamics of uh, that uh, pseudonymous map G are dynamically minimal. Uh, that is, it is a factor map of the original uh, homeomorphism. As such, um, we could think about it as a form of a topological lower bound for the possible complexity of the dynamics. However, um, one way to generalize these ideas to three-dimensional flows would be uh, simply to say that we say a given flow is chaotic or we characterize its dynamical uh, complexity by studying the isotopy class of its uh, first return map. The problem with uh, this approach is that in general, we simply cannot do it. The reason being that given some vector space, uh, sorry, some uh, vector field, there's simply no reason to believe that, uh, that uh, its Poincaré sections, if, it, if they even exist, uh, form uh, compact surfaces. Uh, another problem is that even in the best of cases, when our vector field does uh, generate some compact surface, which we can puncture at finitely uh, many uh, points, the first return map need not be continuous. Here we have uh, an example of this problem. We have the uh, oh, is it? We have the uh, geometric uh, Lorentz model, uh, which is generated by studying the first return map from this cross section, uh, the upper uh, the upper rectangle to itself. This cross section intersects transversely with the stable manifold of the origin, and as such, uh, it generates a discontinuous first return map. I mean, after all, uh, initial conditions arbitrarily close to uh, this transverse intersection would return to the cross section infinitely many times. However, um, initial condition on this uh, intersection simply would never return. And as such, we have a discontinuity. So, ah, sorry, I got a bit carried away. Now, therefore, uh, in the absence of a general theory of how uh, to classify chaotic dynamics for flows, uh, we study uh, uh, specific examples instead. And indeed, uh, in today's talk, uh, I will uh, give you a sketch of how we can analytically prove that for a certain family of vector fields under uh, some topological assumptions, we can in fact find a minimal flow which captures all its dynamical uh, complexity. So without further ado, let us introduce that family. So that family of dynamical systems is the following one, the Bresla system which as you can see, depends on three control parameters, A, B, and C. And uh, one interesting uh, feature about it is that it is almost linear. It is, it has one nonlinearity in the Z component. Before I continue, I should say that uh, this system, which was introduced during the seventies, at least as far as I'm aware of, was not introduced as some uh, model for natural phenomenon. Uh, if, uh, as far as uh, I know, it was originally introduced by Otto Ressler uh, to find the simplest possible uh, model for chaotic dynamics. And uh, the heuristic behind uh, this idea is as follows. Let's recall the poincare bendixson theorem, which uh, essentially rules out the existence of chaotic dynamics for uh, two-dimensional flows in, say, R2. Uh, in R3, we know that linear vector fields cannot generate chaotic dynamics. I mean, after all, we can solve them and we can uh, classify all their possible dynamics simply by looking at the formulas. Uh, so in this case, the restless is, so in this uh, sense, the restless system is dynamically, a dynamically minimal model for chaotic dynamics, simply because when we Z variable, to be uh, sufficiently close to the origin, the dynamics of this vector field would be essentially uh, those of a perturbed uh, linear map, a linear vector field. So in this sense, uh, the dynamics are uh, minimal for the emergence of chaos. And indeed, uh, when uh, Ressla varied the parameters, he discovered that at these parameter values, there indeed existed a chaotic uh, attractor. Additionally, uh, the existence of the chaotic attractor, we more precisely chaotic dynamics, at these parameter values were uh, proven uh, more or less 20 years later by Kudos Vichinsky, 
uh, by applying rigorous numerical methods. Anyway, uh, the existence of the chaotic attractor was not the only uh, thing discovered by Ressler. He also observed that there were parameter values in the parameter space at which no chaos whatsoever was detected. More precisely, he observed that at some parameter values, uh, the chaotic attractor did not exist. And instead of it, what uh, he observed was a stable periodic trajectory which appeared to attract the, uh, any uh, generic initial condition um, in R3. When he varied the parameters and studied how uh, this stable periodic trajectory evolved uh, from this uh, stable uh, attracting dynamics to a chaotic attractor, he observed uh, this periodic trajectory underwent a period doubling cascade after which it collapsed to the chaotic attractors. Sorry, I think I should drink a little. I have a question. Yes. You discovered in what game in this period that we escaped. What yes. Year it was, uh, what, what year it was discovered? Oh, it, was, uh, it was either discovered in the original paper or in some uh, follow-up paper, I think in... Uh, either in uh, the 70s or the 80s, I think. I mean, um, it was uh, discovered. I mean, I don't remember the exact details. I could send them to you afterwards and just search it up on my computer. But... Now, when Ressler and his uh, successors tried to sketch the bifurcation diagram of this period doubling curve, what they observed was that qualitatively they could not distinguish it from uh, the Feigenbaum period doubling cascade. And uh, this uh, in turn led to the emergence of a heuristic about the system, which was later on verified by uh, countless other numerical studies. For example, there's a study by Andrei Shilnikov and Alexei Kazakov. Uh, there's also a study by Balio Blaise and Solano and among others, uh, in which uh, the dynamics of the first return map appear to bifurcate from order to chaos like uh, a one-dimensional system. In numerical studies in particular, the first return maps of the attractor appeared uh, like one-dimensional maps of an interval or some uh, deformed interval. Okay, great. So to continue, oh, uh, here we have an image of the uh, Ressler attractor as discovered by Ressler, I mean, this is from an imagery generated on my computer, but here it is. Anyway, in order to begin analyzing uh, this vector field uh, more precisely, we need to introduce the following assumptions on our parameter space. So from now on, uh, let P denote our parameter space. Uh, we will always assume the vector field uh, for parameters in the space uh, satisfies the following assumptions. First of all, uh, we always uh, fix the, the A and B parameters between zero and one and C greater than one. And we assume that the vector field generates two fixed points, the inner fixed point, which has a two-dimensional unstable manifold, and the outer fixed point with a two-dimensional stable manifold. Additionally, we assume both uh, fixed points are subtle foci, which uh, such that the linearization of the vector field at those fixed points satisfy uh, the following resonance condition. Um, I should say that even though I will not be using uh, this resonance condition explicitly today, in practice, it does figure uh, quite a lot in the proofs of these ideas. And additionally, it is also, in a sense, the main inspiration behind them. The reason being that this is simply the Shilnikov condition, uh, which uh, is, in fact, a part of a very uh, rich theory on homoclinic bifurcations, uh, which uh, is one of the uh, theories about the emergence of complex uh, phenomenon in three-dimensional flows. One uh, third assumption, which we'll always assume, is that the two-dimensional invariant manifolds of both fixed points always intercept transversely. Here, we have a local image of the dynamics you should always have in mind. 
uh, we have the inner fixed point with its two-dimensional manifold and its one-dimensional invariant manifolds, and the uh, corresponding outer fixed point with uh, opposing uh, index and uh, the exact opposite. So, under the first two assumptions, in fact, uh, and, yes. Question: uh, uh, Is it possible to describe uh, a region of ABC or some region that is fine uh, all those conditions? Yes, um, the first two conditions are long known from numerical studies. Um, we know that we know they're satisfied. The third condition about the transverse intersection of the uh, manifolds is something which is uh, again a heuristic about the system, so we fix it to make everything precise. In fact, in a recent paper by Andrei Shonikov and Alexei Kazakov, uh, they show that there are parameters at which there exist initial conditions arbitrarily close to the fixed point. Again, some parameters. Uh, whose uh, forward trajectories uh, arrive very close at the outer fixed point. So in this sense, th this is a way to formalize uh, this observation. Now, under the first two assumptions, in, in fact, under the first, we have the uh, following proposition, which states that given a parameter in our parameter, in our parameter space, there exists a universal cross-section for the flow, which is universal in the following sense. The trajectory of any uh, periodic trajectory has to uh, intersect it transversely at least once. In fact, this is true for the trajectory of any initial condition, which does not diverge to infinity in one, in one way or another. And in addition, this cross-section is a half plane, which uh, intersects transversely with the invariant manifolds for both uh, fixed points on its boundary. Yes, uh, I will not uh, explain the proof of this idea, I just say a few words about it, that this is basically uh, done by considering the uh, cross-section corresponding to the vanishing of the Y derivative. And uh, it pretty much follows immediately from that. So you'll excuse me for not going too deep into the details here. But anyway, another definition will need, yes. The, the, the attractor worth this uh, on the attractor. Uh, let me go back to it. This attractor uh, intersects this. Uh, sorry, the cross section intersects this attractor uh, more or less like this. It's a half plane. Who's, yes, whose um, boundary passes precisely uh, through the uh, middle of the attractor. To, to that little hole in the middle. Yes. Yes, it passes it, it, through the it, fixed it point. Goes out to, to the, yeah, it goes to infinity. And it, 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 so this is a plane, right? So that, that's the boundary. That happens. The, the boundary is yes. like this. And then it, it goes inside of the. the, the, the yes. Screen, it goes, uh, yes, on the, specifically uh, in the case of this um, cross section, we go out, uh, but uh, then we go straight back in through the lower half plane. It's basically the, uh, the cross section is generated by choosing uh, one of the uh, halves of the cross sections. I mean, the cross section is a plane itself and we choose some half plane in it, such that one uh, half plane corresponds to uh, the uh, increase of the uh, y derivative and the other to its decrease. So this is basically the idea of it. Now, now another definition we'll need is the following one, that of trefoil parameters. Um, assume we have a parameter uh, in, oh, is there any question? Uh, um, a parameter in the parameter plane, which generates a heterocolinic knot, like the one we see here in the picture. We say that this parameter is a trefoil parameter, provided uh, the knot it generates in S3 along uh, with infinity is that of a trefoil knot. Uh, I think I should uh, give a rough sketch of what I mean uh, by this. Uh, here we see. Well, what, what do I vote to this? What? Well, uh, is there? Because this uh, supposed to. Uh, what? Oh, okay. So I simply 
Okay, and I can say here. Okay. So here we see an example of how this heteroclinic knot, a truffle knot, uh, looks like in a three further system. But when we sketch it as a bounded knot, it would look more or less like this. Uh, okay, I should uh, delete one cross in here. Okay, so this is essentially how uh, this hyperclinic knot looks like in S3 when we picture it as a knot. And the main result I will present you with today is that at such parameters, whose existence I should note was observed numerically, the uh, vector field generates chaotic dynamics. So this is due to the following theorem, which states the following. Assume we have a trefoil parameter and let us denote the first return map as follows, and let's denote by sigma the one sided shift. Then we have the uh, following uh, three implications. First of all, there exists a curve, a row in the parameter space, such the uh, invariant set of the first return map on the invariant set in the cross section minus that curve is chaotic, by which I mean. Uh, there exists a continuous factor map from uh, this invariant set to the uh, symbol space into symbols, such that the shift is uh, Devaney chaotic on the image of the factor map, by which I mean that the periodic trajectories are dense and there exists uh, a dense trajectory. Wait, what yes. Is I? What? What is I? Oh, I is the invariant set of the first return map in the cross section minus that curve. Curve. The curve uh, I will show it later on, but this is a curve. Uh, you know, actually, I'll paint it right now. It would be easier. What? It better not be a curve because the images are changes. Uh, no, it is a curve you don't uh, enter into. Uh, it looks more or less like this. Let's assume this is our cross section, and these are the fixed points. Then the curve, uh, yeah, Sorry. it looks like something like this. It, it bisects the cross section into. So, where does this go to? Where is I? It's distributed um, among these two halves. But it is a bigger set. Yes. Yes. Uh, this is where I turn it on. Oh, okay. Now, as far as the uh, symbols in pi i are concerned, we have the following. For any uh, symbol which is not strictly periodic to the constant uh, symbol one, then that symbols lie in the uh, image of i. Additionally, in any particular, if that symbol is periodic, then the pre image of that symbol contains at least one periodic point for the uh, first return map of the same minimal period. And finally, that specific periodic point from uh, part two here uh, persists for uh, sufficiently uh, small perturbations of the trefoil parameter. That is, if we perturb the trefoil parameter in the parameter space, uh, this uh, periodic trajectory persists. And it also persists with the same minimal period. Now, um, I will not present the proof of this uh, theorem. It is uh, a bit too long. I will present the main motivation and the highlights of it. But anyway, uh, the idea goes roughly as follows. Here we have uh, an imposition of the trefoil knot on the cross section. And we have the intersection point of the uh, trefoil knot, a transverse intersection point, with the cross section itself. So let's connect the cross section. Yes. By this black curve, and it contains that gamma thing, does it? Yes. Uh, it contains the curve, uh, which connects uh, this transverse interse uh, intersection with a fixed point. And it does not contain the, the purple. Uh, no, uh, this is, uh, I'll get to it in a minute. So um, let's uh, flow gamma along the trefoil. It would have to loop around uh, these separatrices which would imply, heuristically at least, 
that it returns to the cross-section as some closed loop, which begins and terminates at the inner fixed point. Therefore, if we sketch it as a first return map, we get uh, something. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> Go back. Yes. So the point, so you're flowing a lot to the other, because you know, the point cannot never reaches uh, the other point. No, it is not. However, uh, points arbitrarily close uh, Q, P0, uh, do. This is a heuristic behind the proof. This is not uh, the idea itself. This is just a motivation behind it. Points on it never reach the fixed point. I don't quite follow it. No, um, no, no. Okay, let me say it otherwise. Gamma uh, is a curve connecting one point of the uh, stable manifold and the fixed point. Points on gamma themselves do not reach uh, precisely to the fixed point. They do reach, however, um, at least heuristically by the continuity of the flow, arbitrarily close to it. P0, if you iterate a long time, will finally reach, well, infinitely a long time. It will never reach uh, the cross section itself. Oh, okay. However, uh, points sufficiently close to it on gamma would. Okay. I mean, the uh, image of P0 is something uh, which is not even defined. And in fact, this is the main reason why this is a motivation for the proof and not the proof itself. And, and then what you're saying yes. is, that, okay, uh, there's some point very close to P0, which will uh, get P in again. And then- uh, No, no, it does not hit P in. It hits the cross section very close oh, to P in. Cross section, okay, yes. Okay, I mean, I, uh, the P in uh, only uh, P zero after an infinitely long time would reach it. I mean- it's nearly close. Yes, like yes, okay. yes. Its closure is closed. Therefore, if we sketch uh, this picture on the cross section, we get something which should look more or less like this. And therefore, uh, by orientation preserving properties, we would expect the first return map to be a horseshoe. The problem is that this argument, at least the way I presented it, simply uh, cannot uh, be true, simply uh, due to the fact that at P not here, we must have a discontinuity for the first return map. Therefore, we cannot treat uh, this first return map as a, as, a, um, as a topological horseshoe, even if we would like to. In order to overcome this difficulty, what uh, we do is perturb the flow. We blow up uh, both fixed points by hops, by vacations. Um, and uh, then we consider the first return map at the analyst, which lies away from the out, the in, and uh, the blown up intersection point P0. When we impose that first return map on this cross section, we get something similar to this. This allows us to choose A and B sides, uh, which are in this case the intersection of the, of the boundary of the in with the circle. And in this case, some arc connecting the uh, circle P0 with a boundary, which can be uh, resketched as a, as a rectangle map, which looks like this. Now, admittedly, uh, the first return map of the flow could probably be a whole lot more complex than what. I'm sketching here, but the point is that we can conclude the existence of a topological horseshoe, a notion which is, at least as far as I know, is due to James York and Judy Kennedy, which uh, guarantees the existence of an invariant set inside the rectangle, which factors to the entire uh, one uh, side shift into symbols. With a little bit more work, it can be proven that any component in that uh, topological horseshoe dynamics is in fact convex and as such from the bar, uh, from the Brouwer uh, fixed point theorem, if uh, it corresponds to a periodic symbol, it must contain a periodic point of the same minimal period. Now, uh, had these first return maps been diffeomorphisms, this would have probably been enough. And by probably, I mean that you could have probably exploited some uh, Nilsson uh, theory argument to say that when we close up the hop uh, bifurcations and return to the original vector field, uh, the periodic dynamics at least persist. In practice, we cannot do so due to the uh, discontinuities of the first return map. 
Therefore, we have to uh, resort to three-dimensional arguments. Again, uh, due to James York, in this case, uh, with uh, John Malek Ray and um, Kathleen Alcott. The idea goes roughly as follows. Uh, by using uh, notions such as the uh, orbit index uh, theory and in particular the snake termination principle. Oh, oh now it does work. Um, anyway, by using uh, these ideas, we can uh, prove that not only every periodic trajectory persists when we close up the Hoff uh, bifurcations, but they also cannot collide together. That is, when we uh, blow up the hop, uh, uh, the, uh, hop bifurcations, uh, these two uh, periodic trajectories cannot bifurcate from the same trajectory. Here we have a rough illustration of this idea of essentially what can never happen, uh, which in the language of uh, York and John Malay Paray is uh, two snakes of periodic orbits colliding. Anyway, as you may have noticed, this theorem in itself does not answer the question I addressed uh, in, the, well, I did not address it, I only stated it in the uh, beginning of this talk about the possible dynamical complexity of the rest of the system, because even though it does guarantee the existence of chaotic dynamics, it does not guarantee anything about what not types the uh, vector field generates or does not generate. However, um, due to the proof of this theorem, we can do just that. So one uh, main implication, in fact, the main implication from this theorem is the uh, following one. First of all, that given a trifold parameter, we can find a geometric uh, model for the flow unique up to orbital equivalence, which is uh, not only unique, but also hyperbolic on its uh, chain recurrent set. Uh, in particular, any knot type generated by this geometric model, uh, save perhaps for one uh, uh, knot also uh, exists in the original vector field. The proof goes more or less like this. We consider the Hopf uh, perturbations, which we introduced earlier, and we begin by removing any part of the invariant set in the rectangle, uh, which does not correspond to the uh, topological horseshoe. After that, because any component in the topological horseshoe is convex, we simply crush uh, any such component uh, to a periodic trajectory. And we obtain uh, a, a first return map, who's, um, uh, who, which can be described as a suspended snake horseshoe. But if, yes. How do you know that these things are convex? What? How do you know that these things are convex? Oh, uh, this is done by actually analyzing uh, the topological horseshoe by hand. I mean, it requires a bit of work. It's, it's mainly technical, but it's essentially a repeated application of the Kyautos theorem about the intersection of the of Jordan domains. Anyway, uh, do, oh, is there another question? Okay. Uh, due to a theorem of uh, Francois Began and Christian Bonatti, uh, this vector field uh, is unique up to orbital equivalence, which essentially uh, implies the theorem. Now, as a corollary from this theorem, we can in fact uh, characterize all the knots uh, generated by the geometric model quite precisely. Uh, this is due to the uh, template theory uh, by uh, Joan Berman and, oh God, I forgot the name of the second one, uh, Williams. Anyway, uh, anyway, it's due to Berman and Williams, uh, who proved, uh, I think, in the 80s a theorem stating that given a flow, which is on a three manifold, hyperbolic on its chain recurrent set, then uh, there exists a knot holder for the flow, which is uh, a template. A template is a branched surface like the one you see here, uh, which consists of a branch line and several strands, uh, which return to uh, the branch line by covering it. And they often uh, flip uh, somewhere along the way. Uh, the existence of the template allows us uh, to essentially characterize uh, all the knots uh, which are generated by the hyperbolic flow. And specifically, in our case, I prefer not to get uh, too deep uh, into this idea. 
Uh, do you, uh, we can prove that the template uh, generated by the hyperbolic model, which is the one you see here on the left, is uh, isotopic to the one you see here on the right, the uh, Lorentz 01 template. The Lorentz 01 template has been studied extensively, uh, mostly by Philip Holmes. And what we can say about it is that every knot on it is uh, a torus knot. That is, it can be embedded on a torus. So in this respect, we can say that this geometric model is a topological lower bound for the possible complexity of uh, the uh, RESO system at trefold parameters. So in this case, this theorem answers precisely uh, the question I stated at the beginning of the talk for trefold parameters. Now, how much time have I got? Oh, okay. So I'll just, okay, great. So, uh, before I conclude, uh, yes. Did you see the knots on this, the template, the, the, the homes? You know, that, that this one. Uh, yes, this one. They are all knots? Yes, this is what uh, Philip Holmes proved. Um, they're all torus knots, and from uh, the sec from uh, theorem two, we know that say perhaps for again. Uh, say perhaps for one knot on this template, every uh, knot generated uh, by the Lorentz 01 template is also generated by the original vector field. The original vector field, I should state, uh, can and probably is more complex than the dynamics of this idealized model. Uh, there are, uh, in fact, very good indications that uh, this uh, deformation of the flow destroys uh, quite a lot of interesting dynamics around uh, the point at infinity. However, uh, it does capture the essence of chaos uh, in the attractor. I mean, of course, in trefold parameters, there isn't exactly an attractor, but it does capture the essence of chaos in the bounded regions of the vector field. That is uh, the invariant set. Okay, so uh, to conclude this talk, I would just like to say a few words about what happens when we perturb the trefoil. In particular, uh, what happens when we disconnect the trefoil knot. I mean, after all, uh, trefoil parameters and heterocolinic parameters in general often correspond to, at most, uh, curves or a collection of curves in a three-dimensional parameter space. Therefore, uh, we would like to ask what happens generically when we, when we destroy the trefoil. What happens to the uh, dynamics, and in particular, how much of the complexity at the trefoil parameter um, wears off uh, on the nearby parameters in the parameter space? So we obtain from, as a corollary from theorem two and theorem one, we in fact uh, can make the heuristic by uh, Ressler about the connection between the logistic map and uh, the rest of the system precise, at least around trefoil parameters. Um, this is done by uh, the following observation, the heuristic to be more precise. Here on the left, we have a rough illustration of the first three term up, an idealized illustration of it, to be honest, on at the trefoil parameter. As you can see, uh, we have some first three term up, which admittedly should look much more discontinuous, which looks like some horseshoe pinched uh, at the inner fixed point. When we disconnect the trefoil, we would expect uh, the first return map to change as well. For example, if we disconnect it to a homoclinic scenario, this is in fact what we would expect to appear. However, uh, this partition by uh, this curve rho allows us to essentially define symbolic dynamics for the first return map in some uniform way, again, wherever defined. And in fact, um, if we recall that in theorem one we've proven that given any uh, symbol which is not strictly periodic to the uh, constant uh, symbol one, then that symbol is in the symbol uh, set for the trifle parameter, we obtain the following. We can obtain, and I'll say it very briefly due to the time. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, what we can obtain, uh, specifically in the case of trefoil parameters, that we can factor the invariant set of uh, the first return map in the cross-section 
to the dynamics of x squared minus 2 in minus 2, 2, minus 0. Again, by partitioning. And we do so uh, simply by identifying the symbols. I mean, after all, since 0 is a critical point and, that, and since it is proprionic, we can simply identify uh, any symbol here with a symbol in this invariant set. And we can, in fact, uh, hone this argument a bit further by proving the following theorem, which states that at a given uh, neighborhood of the trefoil parameter, uh, we can uh, define a function pi from that neighborhood to the parameter space of the uh, logistic family, such that uh, if we set d as the image of pi at v, then there exists an invariant set, uh, a bounded invariant set on the real line for the polynomial, such that on that invariant set, the polynomial is a factor map of the first return map. And additionally, the factor map is continuous at least on the periodic trajectories in the invariant set for the flow. Additionally, as far as the continuity of pi goes, it is uh, continuous at least uh, on the regions of structural stability in that neighborhood. And finally, when the parameter V is sufficiently close to the trifle parameter, the invariant set for the polynomial uh, intersects the Julia set uh, in at least two periodic uh, points. This is uh, simply oh, a very uh, immediate corollary from uh, the third part of theorem one, uh, according to which the periodic trajectories of the trifle persist under perturbation, and they do so without uh, changing the minimal period. Anyway, uh, this is it. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so I didn't quite get the, the Julia set comment. Can you describe? Oh, uh, yeah. For uh, periodic, uh, sorry, for quadratic polynomials, the Fatou set may contain at most uh, one periodic point. So at the moment, there are uh, at least, say, three uh, periodic trajectories in this invariant set. We know. Uh, the invariance that has to intersect the Julia set for the polynomial. It's just a pain. What? This really important set of pain. Uh, for the flow, possibly. Yes, they are. We identify uh, the polynomials with the flow by the symbols. Uh, we do not have a lot of local information about the periodic trajectories for the flow. They may be repelling. Uh, the orbit uh, index theory uh, by James York, in fact, implies that they probably are repelling uh, for uh, the flow as well. However, uh, this cannot be uh, proven, at least not, not, at least I don't know how to do it now. They cannot be attracting. They can be attracting. Um, this depends uh, a lot on how the horseshoe breaks, the topological horseshoe breaks when you perturb the trefoil. Uh, the thing is that the persistence of periodic trajectories is proven uh, with the orbit index theorem. And more precisely, it is proven by noting that at least up to the uh, trefoil parameter, the orbit index is minus one, which implies the existence of one eigenvalue for the uh, local first return map at the periodic trajectory, um, which is. Uh, which is real and lies uh, away from one, which is bigger than one. It does not say too much about the second one. It only says that it is uh, non-negative, if I remember correctly, but you cannot immediately conclude it. I mean, uh, for example, uh, the uh, theory by York, in fact, allows uh, for uh, these periodic trajectories to bifurcate from a period doubling uh, bifurcation of the stable trajectory of the attractor. It can happen. I mean, the idea is roughly that if this is a trifle parameter and this is the continuation curve. Can I ask a more yes. serious question before we continue the discussion? No, we're talking for 44 minutes about a system evolving in R3. Yes. And all of a sudden, Julia sets appeared and complex. And how, how did that happen? That's the area. So, yes. Oh, it's just intersection. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, the real Julia set. I should have written it here, but I'm talking about the, the intersection of the Julia set with the real log. 
I'm not making any assumptions about a complex version of this theorem. I should, however, say that there are some numerical indications. This is a very surprising part. I have no idea how to prove it. Maybe some of you do. Um, but there are some numerical indications of a possible complexification of this uh, theorem, which in my opinion is very surprising, but numerically they exist. So what do I know? Um, but anyway, when I refer here to the Julius set, I mean to the, I refer to the uh, intersection with a real line. Anyway, uh, as far as uh, the periodic trajectories of the uh, trefoil and their persistence, we know that at least sufficiently close to the trefoil, the index is minus one. However, uh, the theory by York and John Malipare does not rule out the index changing to plus one. That is, uh, in a sense, if this is the parameter space on some curve, then uh, they uh, do a uh, back turn, in a sense back towards the uh, position of the trefoil. And in this case, the index changes, and when the index changes, the uh, dynamics at this periodic trajectory possibly become attractive. It is something which cannot be ruled out. And additionally, however, what we do know, if such a uh, case occurs, is that this would be a period doubling modification for the flow. This is what we can we can see. I should also state that as a part of the uh, results I did not mention here, uh, it can be proven that in the space of vector fields, not necessarily in our parameter space, uh, the trifle parameter is arbitrarily close to period uh, doubling uh, bifurcations and subtle mode bifurcations. Um, establishing this appearance in our parameter space is far harder. Admittedly, I don't know how to do it, but it does hold in the space of vector fields. Um, are there any more questions? So, well, what, so your your the comparison of your actual system with the horseshoe, in particular, what would be, you, you throw out the water spot, and then and then you yes. concentrate on some basic. Yes, I restrict myself, so. and then you draw conclusions from that, which is very nice. Now, how, how do you know that these so, so what is the comparison with the quadratic family in particular, and why not with the 10th family? Where does the differentiability appear in this? Um, admittedly, it does not. The reason we choose it is because this, in fact, correlates with the numerics. This is why. I mean, this theorem uh, does not really stand as itself. Uh, it, it stands in light of the numerics. You could probably, uh, by using needing theory, also define different. Uh, unimodal families and factor uh, this uh, family of vector fields to them. However, I should state, and this is taking me to the uh, question about the possible complexity, uh, complexification of this theorem, that one interesting uh, feature which arose, uh, I think, in a study by uh, Roberto Barrio, uh, Fernando Blesa, and Sergio Serrano, was that if we take uh, a two-dimensional slice of our parameter space, then we have the following image, a spiral, uh, with some spiral center, which uh, admittedly is the main inspiration behind trefoil parameters. There are indications of the parameter space. In the parameter space. There are indications that uh, the dynamics of the spiral center, even though uh, it lies on the Shonikov homoclinic curves are in fact heteroclinic. However, the point is that in addition to uh, the spiral, there exists another bifurcation curve in the parameter space, which uh, divides the uh, possible dynamics of the first return up to two possible bifurcations. On, uh, well, my right or left, I guess. Well, on this side, the dynamics of the first return map appeared uh, to be unimodal. On the other hand, on this side, the dynamics of the first return map already appear bimodal. And at least as far as I uh, know, there is, I, I don't know if there is a way to explain this modification in the context of one dimensional dynamics. Schwarzen. What? The Schwarzen uh, I have literally no idea, but, um, I do know that it possibly can be explained in the context of holomorphic dynamics. 
specifically in the context of polynomial-like maps for cubic uh, maps, which, as we know, contain uh, the Mandelbrot set infinitely many times. So this uh, bifurcation line possibly, and I'm saying possibly because I have no idea how to even begin approaching this, uh, corresponds when, uh, as far as this map is concerned, um, when it leaves the uh, some copy of the Mandelbrot set in the cubic uh, connected uh, connected as locus and enters the uh, proper cubic area in a sense. That's what I would guess happens, but again, it's nothing but a guess. Um, are, there any more, uh, um, uh, are there any more questions? Okay. 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 